What I have here is a little simulation I hacked together this morning with our computer science scratch pad. And at, at first cut, it's really just a way to think about two-dimensional projectile motion. You can go left and right, and it'll change the angle at which you launch. And then you click your mouse, and it'll actually launch, it'll actually launch the object at that angle. And the velocity right now, you can't set it with the, with the, just with your mouse. You need to actually go in the code to change the velocity. So right now, our initial velocity is 11 meters per second, whatever launch angle. We could change it to, say, 15 meters per second. And now, when we launch it, you see the thing going much faster and actually much further as well. But maybe if you have a lower angle, maybe it doesn't go quite as far. Or you can maybe launch it straight up, something like that as well. So not all of the variables are adjustable by the mouse. But it is, it is a fun way to just play with, it is a fun way to just play with kind of getting an intuition for projectile motion. You see the vectors that are being plotted around the projectile or on the projectile. The yellow vector is the x component of velocity. And we see that's not changing. And that's because right now we haven't implemented any air resistance. And then the orange vector, the one that's going up and down, that's the y component of velocity. And you see, right when you launch it, it is going very fast in the upward direction, slower in the upward direction, now, now going downwards. And there was actually a moment there where in the, in, in, it, it switches from going up to down. And that's the point where that, that vector kind of disappears for a second. And then along with that, it's showing that the gravitational field, or while, while the object is in free fall, you could view it as the acceleration due to gravity, that that is staying constant the entire time. The gravitational field does not change. While the object is in free fall, it is constantly de de decelerating the y ve velocity, even turning it negative so that the object eventually does come down. And if all of this is happening too fast, you can change the time increment. So that's what this dt is right over here. So if every loop you want a little less time to pass, you just lower that value. So now you'll see it looks like it's happening in slow motion. Because every time we're going to the loop, we're, we're incrementing time less. But we at the same tol total aggregate time. It's just slowing down the entire simulation. And you could even change something like gravity. You could change it. It's like, what happens if gravity is very, very low? So let's launch something. And then you see in this reality, gravity and even the gravity, the, the gravitational field vector you can barely see here, but the thing just keeps floating away and away and away. So you could think about what might happen, what might happen on other planets. So this is this is all this is all fun, fun and everything. But what's really interesting is that traditionally in physics class, you tend to ignore air resistance because Air resistance complicates things a lot, especially if you're trying to work with analytical equations. But the good thing is about computers is you can start to model more, more sophisticated behavior. And so what we've done here, so these are all, we've already talked a lot, about, a lot about these variables. But right here, we have some variables that could be used to model air resistance. Right now, in this current implementation, we are not. We are not modeling air resistance, but it could be used. So later, if we do model it, then we can change these variables and see what happens over here. And so what I want you to do is to think about how you actually can model air resistance. And we've actually implemented an air resistance, or we've put up a shell of an air resistance function right over here. We haven't implemented it. That's for you to do. And it takes in some inputs like the velocity in a given direction. So this could be the x velocity, the x component of velocity, or the y component of velocity, the magnitude of that velocity in the x or the y directions, a drag coefficient, the kind of area that's facing into uh, uh, the that's kind of the cross-sectional area of the object. or And you could actually define it so it takes in other inputs there. And then earlier on, we actually defined the air density. And so you could use these variables somehow to define what the force in that direction, opposing that velocity, what the force of air resistance would be, or air friction, however you might want to view it. And then down here, we just have a line that makes sure that the direction of that force as, as specified by its sign, is opposite the direction of what the velocity is. So if this is a positive velocity, that force is going to be negative. And you can see later in the code where we make use of this. But the interesting thing is, how do you model this? And so I encourage you to, one, you could look up things like drag coefficients and drag equations to see what kind of people already believe. Or you might not want to do that and just try to model it completely on your own. But even if you do look at things like drag coefficients and drag equations, there's a lot of unknowns there. There's a lot of, of factors that you won't know until you really go outside and try to model something. So the really fun part of this is to go outside, find some type of projectile, and launch it. And then collect data, and then use that data to tweak the variables 
for your coefficients, for whatever you put into this air resistance, so that this simulation really is predictive of what's happening outdoors. So I really encourage you to do that. And so you might say, well, you know, I, I, I might be able to do this if I have something where I know the launch velocity and I know the launch angle, but how do I do it if I just have a ball? And that is even an, an even more interesting problem, because you actually can do a lot not even knowing the launch velocity and launch angle, but if you just know the time in the air and the distance that the ball travels horizontally, you might be able to use that data to tweak your coefficients. And so a next order project actually would even be to write a computer program or a function as part of this program that can input all of the data that you measure and then uses that to tweak your actual variables, to tweak your actual air resistance function so that this simulation models, models the actual whatever's going on, your object, your projectile actually traveling. And then if you really want to get into the, the bowels of this code, and I encourage you to do so because this is kind of an unfinished product here, there's a ton of improvements that you could actually make to this code itself. One, you could tweak many, many more of the variables on with the mouse. You could add some sliders or something like that, or buttons or radio buttons that would help you uh, change the variables so you don't have to keep changing it in the code. You could add more visualizations here, maybe plotting the path of the projectile, maybe plotting what it would do with air resistance and what it would do without air resistance. You can overlay some vectors, which is the force of air friction in, in either the x or y direction. And if you really want to go you know, take it to the next level, you could even turn this into some type of a game. Maybe you're shooting at some target, or the wind changes, or there's some ambient wind, and you visualize that some way. So I think this could be a, a, a pretty, a pretty interesting thing to do. Now, with that out of the way, you, you might not be interested in this next part, but I, I will just do a quick walkthrough of the code for those interested in how this code, what it, the different parts are doing, or might want to dig into it and start to modify the program. So we already talked about this part. These are all just a bunch of variables that, and actually the variables up here are being used, the variables down here are not being used. They, in theory, could be used in when we start to think about air resistance. These are all other things that set our initial state. X is our initial x value, and I really should say our x value, initial x value in meters, in meters. We convert it to pixels later. So y value in meters, in meters. So the starting point, the starting point is y equals zero, and then it, it goes y zero meters and ends up at zero meters again, and then the x is you see 6.42 meters. We later convert that into pixels and kind of flip the y because. The way we're doing it, a high y value, the is y is essentially the height, so a high value should be high. But the coordinate system for the actual scratch pad has y equals 0 up here and y equals 400 pixels down here. So we do a little bit of a transformation there, and you can we'll see that later in the code. This essentially sets the scale, so pixels per meter. This tells us where our actual ground is, so this 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 level right over here. Now this breaks our velocity into the x and y components, a little bit of trigonometry. This code is really just what selects our pictures. And actually, it's a fun tweak to just change these pictures. You can actually change what the default projectile is. So you can make purple pie be the thing that gets projected. So let's, let's launch him. So you could do all sorts of interesting things to the code like that, and that's kind of a, a fairly straightforward. We already talked about this air resistance function. That would be a really interesting thing to set. This restates the this resets things. Every time you click and relaunch, it resets all of the variables. And then this right over here is actually what draws the projectile and all of the associated vectors with the projectile. So it gets a little involved, really just around drawing the triangles at the end of the vector points. You might want to break it up into other functions, maybe have a draw vector function, make the code a little bit cleaner. But that's what all of that code just does. And actually, this is a little uh, this is a draw arrow function. And then this is this code right here is what writes all of this information up here at the top of the screen. And then we have the draw the cannon, that literally draws this cannon. And then if we go the draw the sky in the background, hopefully self-explanatory, draws the sky in the background. So if you want to change the background, you can mess with this function. And then this is kind of the meat of the program, the thing that's called repeatedly. And this is where it collects the angle, the next launch angle, based on your mouse movement. So it collects your mouse movements for the next launch angle. And then if the mouse is pressed, so that's where you click it, and it'll relaunch. It'll reset state and launch it over again. And then this draws the background. So every time it refreshes, I encourage you to see what happens if you get rid of that line so that it redraws everything. And then it says, look, if y, if we're literally at the ground or above the ground, let's increment time. 
by a certain amount. And let's figure out what the acceleration is in different directions. And you see over here in the y direction, we have the acceleration due to gravity and free fall. And then I put a call to the air resistance function. Right now, that air resistance function just returns 0, so it doesn't affect anything. And then over here, I put the net acceleration in the x direction. I make another call to the air resistance function. This time, I pass the velocity in the x direction. The first time I pass the velocity in the y direction. Right now, that's 0, so you have no air resistance there. But then it uses that net acceleration to figure out what the new y velocity and the, what the new x velocity is. It averages them to figure out, to essentially take our, uh, our incremental distance over that little amount of time. And this is where we increment the distances in the x and y directions. And then we set the old velocities essentially to be the new ones, so that next time we're through the loop, the new velocity is now what kind of our, our baseline. Then we draw the projectile, we draw this information, and then we draw the cannon. The whole reason why I drew the cannon after the projectile is so it looks like the projectile is coming out of the cannon. So that's what we'll walk through the code. I hope you have some, some fun with it.